in backwaters all over the Northeast and into the Mid-Atlantic. You'll see silver sides occupying marshy waters just like this. You'll see them occupying in by the marshes, out into the tidal zone, a favorite food of fishes. Silver sides have a clear and dominant head area, ghostly impression for the rest of their body. They move with flicks of the tails. Their upper body stays pretty stiff through the water. Their location, they, they blend in beautifully in the water from above, below, or the sides, and their location is given away when they can't swim properly in the flash. This is the woven silver side, an excellent pattern for imitating silver sides. I'll tell you what, too, this is how my sons started learning how to fish when they were growing up, working silver sides. In tying the woven silver side, everything begins with things called dubbing brushes. Now, dubbing brushes are available through uh, Enrico Puglisi's product. Um, I don't know exactly what he calls them, EP dubbing brushes or whatever, but EP Fibers is the name of the company, and if you were to look that up, you would be able to buy pre-made dubbing brushes from Enrico in whatever color and sizes you're looking to get. Now, <clears throat> in my particular case, uh, I make my own dubbing brushes. I use this device that you see right here. Um, uh, a fellow by the name of Anthony, and boy, I apologize to Anthony, but I do not remember Anthony's last name at this point, but he makes these, and if you just look up dubbing brush makers online, I think you can find them. Just look for the white one like this. It's an excellent product. It works extremely well. Um, and it, it does open up a, a, a wide range of tying possibilities. Now, um, what you do is you, very simply, tie this down. Um, I'm just going to spin this a little bit to take up the bulk of this wire right here. I'll cut that off eventually so it's not a big deal. Now I need to make two dubbing brushes. Um, let's see. The first dubbing brush that I need to make is one for a, a lighter belly color, like a whitish sort of color, and that's what I'm going to do first. The second one I'm going to make is going to be for more of a, a pale green back. Now, um, when I make this dubbing brush, an important consideration is that you do not want this to be too thick. I have not tied this fly probably in about a year and a half to two years, uh, maybe even more, maybe three or four years. Um, and I just practiced on one a little while ago. And it came out okay, but not as good as I would want it to have come out. And the biggest mistake I made was making the material too thick. So to make a dubbing brush, and I'm only going to make the white one here, um, you can make your darker colored back one the same exact way. I'm just not going to create such a long video as it'll bore you out of your mind. But I start with, these are EP fibers. And as I start with these, what I'm going to do, I have a, a stainless steel wire in this groove right here. And then I'm going to tease this apart. This is very important. I'll tease through a, a good amount of it. Um, it's very difficult for me to explain to you what a good amount is until you play with a few and get a feel. The number one mistake that you can make is to make it too thick. I would rather have too thin than to have too thick. And the reason for that you will see when we actually tie the fly. This is all preparatory to tying the woven stone fly. Uh, I mean, the woven silver side. And this is really a pattern, I'm spreading it out a little bit here because I just thought that it was a little bit too thick. Um, this is a pattern that goes all the way back to the designs of George Grant out in Montana when he would do his woven stonefly nymphs, which is why I mentioned stoneflies just a minute ago. I was thinking of this. And uh, it's really a fun way to tie. This particular pattern is very effective. I, I can tell you that there have been times when I have fished on my home water with people from foreign places, namely John Pecorum, who was my fly tying mentor, oh, one of my primary ones, and pro sit there and I, he, he didn't have any flies with him, so I said, here, yeah, take any one you want out of my box. Well, I had one woven silver side with me, and uh, he proceeded to beat the tar out of me that day fishing with this particular fly. It's a very effective pattern. 
It does, however, take quite a while to tie. So if you enjoy tying, by all means, fish this fly and tie up a bunch. If you don't enjoy tying, then um, don't. <laughs> Uh, if I was to sell these to the public, they would probably be in the neighborhood of about 20 bucks each because they take upwards of an hour to tie. All right, uh, at this point, I will take a quick look in here and see if there's any area where I think that it's a little super sparse and just put a couple of fibers in those areas. That's really about it. Now, since I'm tying a fly that's designed to imitate a silver side, what I want to do is include some blue flash. When silver sides flash under the water, they, without a doubt, flash kind of a um, pearlescent blue color. And I want to make sure that I include that. So I get out a product like Angel Hair or some, some product like that, very, very, very fine. And I lay it directly on top of the EP fibers. And the whole purpose of this is to just put some flash in there. I don't want to over overdo it. Um, it's, I, I make these videos by myself and it's very hard for me to know what this looks like right now. But it should look um, noticeable but not like hit you over the head uh, flashy. Just enough to say hey this is here. All right, here we go. And now we get to the next part of the process. You need something to trap these fibers in, or it's possible, particularly early in the spinning process, that they'll fly all over the place. So a very good product for that is some kind of super glue. So you just run it up and down the stainless steel wire, as you can see I'm doing right here. I think I started this outside the realm of the picture. Uh, hopefully the lens is able to show you that I'm getting like a bead of super glue on here. Okay, hopefully you can see that. I'm not sure if you can. Lift it up, lay it right on top, hook it around here, and spin it a little bit to lock it in. Now at that point, I'm going to cut it loose. I ordinarily use, um, let's see if I have any on me here. Yeah, look at that. I do have it. Very good. I ordinarily use wire cutters. Snip. I don't want to waste my scissors on that. And then I take this tray out from underneath like that. I like to pinch here for now. Shorten it up a little bit so it spins better. And in the beginning I just want to trap all the fibers down. Now if you take a look here, do you see how it's not that tight, the twisting of the wire on the inside here? You have to, you cannot begin to brush this until you get that good and tight. Um, you can look over here on the right to get a good idea of the tension in it and the tightness. But we're still not there yet. I want to get this really good and tight. Now we're looking pretty good. I have here a cat comb. And with this cat comb, I also have another one here. This is a very aggressive one. If I was using thicker material, I would by all means use this. But I'm, I really don't want it to be that tight, and I'm not brushing very hard right now. I'm keeping it very light, very soft. This is far from finished. What I'm going to do at this point is just twist some more. Um, what I don't want to have happen is I absolutely positively do not want to pull these fibers out. So each turn tightens them in a little bit and that crazy glue is setting them in tighter yet and sparse is really the key and if you take a look at this dubbing brush I know it was white on white so it's tough to see so I put my hand under here this is sparse and that's what you want you do, if you look at your dubbing brush and you see um, thick dubbing material in here whether it be EP fibers or if you're using a fur that's not what we're looking for. We want breathability and we want what will become action in the water. Okay. I'm still not as tight as I want to be, but I am getting pretty close. 
it's extremely important that this not be too thick because that will make the weaving process much, much, much more difficult. All right. I think this is looking pretty good. I think it's pretty tight. And I think we have our dubbing brush locked in. Now, what I like to do is to somewhat similar to um, folding hackle, I like to come underneath and just stroke these fibers into one direction only before I take it off the brush. It's a lot easier to do now. It's tight. It's as if you got somebody holding it for you. Okay. If you notice here, if you look, there's really no thick buildup of material on the bottom side of the dubbing brush and that's extremely important for making the tying of this fly easier. Okay. I have looked at Enrico's uh, dubbing brushes at fly fishing shows and his are done well. They're not too thick. They're, they're done really, really well. Okay, so here you have a dubbing brush, nice and tightly woven. Now I'm going to trim it and break it right off. We'll be using it in a little while. Okay, so the thought dawns on me that uh, <laughs> white on white is not the best way to see what's going on here. So. I'm continuing with a second dubbing loop, but I've already laid out all of my um, darker fibers for the dorsal side of my woven silver side. It's a kind of a light olive. And um, as I look through, I'm looking for any little holes in it where I think it could use a couple more fibers. And uh, I think it's spread out. I think it's good enough. I think it's distributed. And the one issue is it might be a little bit dense, but I think I'll be able to work around it. Then I take... Um, a little bit of angel hair type of flash to mix in here with this. And then I, again, just like before, I distribute it, you know, as evenly as I possibly can. It's, it's not the end of the world if it's a little bit clumped together because when you comb it out, you are going to take some of these fibers out. There we go. Okay, here we go again. Flash is such an important thing. When a bait fish flashes, it tends to indicate that it's not swimming correctly, which makes it an easy target. So, including some flash is good. Too much flash, I don't particularly like. I'd imagine when bluefish are blitzing, a lot of the time. Sometimes bluefish are very picky, but a lot of the time it won't be a big deal. Um, so, anyway, remember what I said before, take some crazy glue, make a bead going across a bead of this crazy glue type of stuff, cyanoacrylic glue. Oh, there we go. Lift it up. Place it on top. A few turns to lock in the stainless steel fiber here. Take this out from underneath. Wire cutters. Cut it so it's close to it. I actually think I reversed directions there, which could end up being a problem in the long run. Okay, so you can see that the tension is starting to form as the knots twist, but I don't dare yet use my uh, cap brush because it's still not that tight yet. Now we're getting pretty good. Alright, so can you see how... Oh, look at that. It's coming pretty good. I was afraid I used a little too much and I, apparently I did not. I'm, I'm right at the limit of what I would ever want to use on one of these brushes. So, see here at this right end, that's a little too thick. You see how you get that build up right there? I'll probably end up either not using this one or being very careful about when I use it. And I'm also going to work this dubbing brush in there a little bit more so than I would at... Uh, regular dubbing brush. Now just in case this helps, 
I'm going to take out the more aggressive building brush. You can hear it clicking in there. You know, that's looking pretty good. That's that's not too bad. Right here, if you notice, it's a little thick, so I'm going to work that over a little bit. Now, this being a more aggressive brush, it will pull more fibers out. So let me get back in there with the more gentle brush. Just about done brushing this out. Um, now I'm going to fold it like I would fold hackle. If you wanted to and you felt confident enough, you could actually trim it here. I don't do that. I trim it when it's on the fly. I like to eyeball it that way a little better so I can see the sense of proportion. But there we go. Always so important to look on the bottom here. And it, you know, it just... I would say I give this one a grade B and the other one a grade A. It's just a, a hair thicker in some spots. Like this is good right here. This is a little bit thick here. Um, and again, I don't think the fish are going to care too much, but it will have an impact on how you weave this when we put it on the hook shank. This is what we're aiming for in the end, the woven silver sides. This is the first one I have done in a very long time. Not perfect. You got a little bit of too much green on the belly there. A um, little sparse in here, maybe a little sparse here, a little thick there. So we'll try to clean that up on this one. Uh, the fly really pulsates and breathes in the water. I think that's one of the things that makes it great. Plus, it's very translucent. And at the end of the day, I would put a little epoxy on the heads here. I just glued the eyes on with some aqua seal yesterday. So, <clears throat> without any further ado, let's get started on tying the woven silver side. Now I'm a little bit at an odd angle here. I don't usually videotape over my shoulder, but this is a very unique pattern um, involving some pretty unique skills. So I think for that sake, we're better off doing that. Um, by that I mean shooting over my shoulder. Okay, so here is a Gamagatsu SP113H hook. What I really want you to take away from it is that the silver side is a bait fish that flicks its tail a lot when it moves. It's not so much a whole body wiggler like a sand eel. So I do like a stiffer front portion of this particular fly. Okay, uh, I don't think we need to go all the way to the head. It's really not a big deal. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to do so. What I would like to do is tie this very similar to how we tie a lefty's deceiver. That is to say, I want one clump on the bottom left, one clump on the bottom right, and one clump straight across the top. So, I loop, tie in on the near side, lock that in right there. Okay, I don't want it any longer than about, boy that's <laughs> really blocked your view there. I don't want it any longer than about this, so I'll cut there. And this is really going to be awkward for me because I have to try to keep my tying arm in an unnatural position to stay out of your way and I apologize if it blocks your view at times and it will probably affect my tying a little bit. Okay, so I have basically the bottom inside covered. Now I'm going to do the bottom outside. Try to take a pretty equal clump of tying material. All right, I'll actually go up a little ahead of where the other one's tied in. That's so that there's not one big bump on the shank. Okay, locking it in. I'm tying a little looser here because I don't want to splay things out. If you notice, I just moved that back so I have an idea of where my turning point is or my, my last tying point. I can just move that back again. And if you notice, I still have about an eighth of an inch to go. So there we go. I have them both locked in. Measure it out. Trim it to the same length as the other one. We'll trim that a little bit more later. And um, as I look here, I think I'm a little bit sparse in that region. So I'm just going to tie a few fibers, not much at all, in that area, just so it doesn't look like I have a little bit of a hollow spot. Um, I don't think the fish would ever care about this. This is the 
anal side of a fly tire doing this right here. Okay, now the anal side of a fly tire will also notice that this looks very unfish like here. So just to give you an idea of where we're going with this, I'm going to lop off pretty much all of that. And that, and over there, and also a little bit right here. Now that will do for now, okay? That's maybe a little bit shorter than I want it to be, but I'll just make sure I put a little bit longer um, green over the top. Now, uh, before I get to the green, I just want to put a little bit of flash. I really like this stuff called Glimmer Flash. And you could use flashaboo, you can use any type of synthetic flash that you like. Again, I loop it, lock it, put it in place there. I want to make sure that the flash is spread out. I, I don't want the flash to be like a perfect straight line on both sides. So it's spread out on both sides, which is what I want. All right, loose there. I'm not tying tight at all right here. Now I'm starting to tighten up, and you can see the pressure increase on the vise. It's starting to go up and down. Okay, that's that. I gotta keep my arm out of the way here because of the camera deal. All right. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do is tie in some green along the top, and here we have that. I'll pull up a little bit further on the shank. I'm actually only doing about half of the amount that I'm going to end up putting on there for a couple of different reasons. The biggest one of which is that I want to bury the flash within the body. So I'll trim this a little longer. I can always cut it back a little bit more later. And then I come and I grab some DNA, which I think is just super, super, super stuff. My good and uh, a really great man, departed friend now, Jake Shakespeare. Jake was... Uh, very into DNA and really turned me on to it. It's, it's super stuff for catching fish. Um, lay it right over the top. Again, spread it out a little bit as you can. This is the Hollow Fusion DNA. They have a couple of DNA products. Okay. <coughs> All right. There we go. And then I'm going to put a little bit more of the green on top of this yet. I just slid that forward on the hook shank a little bit because I wanted it there. And there we go. That's enough for now. I'll, I'll trim it back in a little while. Um, I do want to make sure I go side to side over the top. So notice how I spin that and it goes side to side. I pulled it apart a little bit with my fingers before and I will clasp it like this to make sure that as I go down the shank I'm not going to rotate it just to one side so it stays evenly distributed across the back which you can see right there that it is okay um, now the next step in the system is to tie in the dubbing brushes that we made before and this is this is a little tricky here so um, this is the part of the fly that takes it to the major leagues obviously everything we just did is very simple um, I am going to tie this particular piece in on the near side I want the fibers to start pretty much uh, just a hair before that tail starts Okay, tightening it up as I go there, or go forward I should say. And then the same thing for the green, but the green it's very important that that stays more on top of the hook shank for reasons that will become apparent in a little bit. Okay, now I'm going to wrap forward all the way to the eye now. And anybody who has ever seen me tie anything knows that what I want to make out of my flies is something practically indestructible. 
if for some odd reason I'm tying something for a shadow box, I might be very particular about a tiny head and using less material and less wraps and lumps and bumps. But right now I want to catch fish. And the last thing I want to have happen is in the middle of fighting a fish, I don't want to all of a sudden realize that pieces of my dubbing brush or whatever else I'm tying in start falling out. So I loop my synthetics over to lock them in and I loop over the metal ends of the dubbing brush to lock them in. All right. Now I'm just going to form a pretty good base right here. If you really want to be fancy with this fly you can put in some kind of a uh, tinsel base underneath here. I don't find it's necessary and I have no problem catching fish without it. Now we're going to do something very very strange that you don't often do when tying a fly. You're going to get rid of your thread. So I tie a whip finish and my thread is done. Now we need to start talking about how to weave. Okay. So focal point locked in. I'm going to do my best to keep my shoulder out of the way which makes this a little more difficult to tie. Ideally, I would be sitting directly in front of the eye of the hook, and I could see this straight on. That would be best for me, but it would be worse for you. So I'm now going to weave, and in weaving, I have to watch very carefully how my pattern goes. What I want is for the white to always end up on the bottom, and for the green to always end up on the top. And what that means is that I'm going to need my cat brush, I'm going to need my bodkin and I'm going to need plenty of patience. So notice how I am pulling the green over the top and I am now going to separate the fibers a little bit. I actually have, if you can notice it here, I have a piece of Velcro glued to the back of my bodkin and then I'm going to pick the white up. Here it is. I'm going to go over the green but then, so can you see that I, I picked the white up and the white is going over the green? Okay. Now I'm going to pull the green across the back of the vise. And, you know, I have no... Oh, look at that. I can't tighten this. Uh, hopefully that, that tightening works because otherwise I'm in danger of losing the focal point a lot. And I sure hope I don't do that to you. All right. So anyway, the green comes over the top. The white goes under the bottom. Green over the top loop here and you see how I'm looping the white over so I'm actually locking the fibers in by interlacing the wire dubbing brushes and I just pull these fibers back for the green and I have the green going over the top Green over the top, white under the belly. That's the, the model all the way up here. White underneath, see how I'm passing the white underneath? Green stays on top. Never, ever, ever does the green go underneath the shank. Likewise, never, ever, ever does the white go above the shank. Just remember that as you work this through. Now you can see that the green looks like it's under the shank right here, but it's really not. Because, and I'm going to pull this up in just a second, I now pull my green up to get it to the top of the shank. Okay, and I pass my white underneath. This is very, very, very problematic when you're standing on the side to see that you're actually nailing it perfectly all the way through. I'm going to take my bodkin. I've tracked some, trapped some fibers in here and that happens a lot when you weave longer fibers like this. So if you cut them shorter you trap less. I think you can see the importance now of the very very thin wire. If this is fat and bulky you trap so many more fibers but with thin you don't really trap very much. And just a well, I don't really want to turn the, the position because then I'll lose the base there, but I can already see as I'm looking on the side here that I have green on the top and I have a nice distinctive line between white and green forming on this side. So 
I'm actually going to use the bodkin to separate a space here. Do you see how I'm doing that? And that'll bring a place for me to weave, bring in, weave over the top my white underbelly. And then I'm going to come through to the bottom here. I'm going to pick that back up again. Don't worry if you lose pressure on this. That's not a big deal. <laughs> the, the big thing with me is I don't want to lose positioning for the camera purposes and the focal plane. So I really hope this is working. It's a very long fly to tie, and I don't want this to go wrong. Um, I started to see my fibers spinning to the wrong side, so I took a moment to pull them back into the right side, and I have some being trapped down here. So I just took care of those and brushed them into the correct direction. There I am creating that little hollow again, that little gap. And I pull the white over the top. And now... Oh, that's too high. Pull the white over the top. And I, I don't want to lose track of working these whites on the bottom. I, I Just please forgive me for just a moment. I'm going to just rotate this up. I just want to make sure I can brush out the whites on the bottom. And hopefully you see that really well where you are. So here I'm creating a hollow again. A little gap to pass the white through. Remember the white stays on the bottom. This little bit of a wiggle in the vise would never matter if I was tying it for myself. It only matters because I want to make sure everything stays in focus for the video. Um, notice again, where's the white? Under the shank. Where's the green? Above the shank. The better I can do that, the more, the better the fly is going to look. Okay, take your time. I can't emphasize that enough. You've already committed to a fly that takes better, the better part of an hour to tie. Um, you might as well take the time to do it right and not lose patience. Okay, uh, come up right through that little hollow I made there. But then, see, the, here's where people make a mistake, right here. They pull the white over the top. Do not come over the green, but pull the white back down again. If you pull the white back down again, you're in good shape. Okay, I'm working my way up the shank. All right. I'm going to pause the video for a minute and I'm going to complete the rest of the shank. It's just the same exact procedure over and over and over again, but I can do it a little faster, not take so much time out of your watching this video, and I, I will be able to get it cleaner because I'll have it facing me. Okay? So I'll be back in just a minute with the rest of the fly caught up to the next really new step to do. You'll notice a couple of things. Uh, first off, I have I am done tying all of the loops of the material and weaving all the way up to the eye of the hook. The next thing you'll notice is that it really doesn't matter if you take any pressure off of these stainless steel dubbing uh, brushes. Now I'm going to come over the top and I'm going to lock these babies in by putting my thread back on the shank. Okay, do that there. Now, an advantage to this particular fly is that you have um, a longer shank hook, so odds are nothing's really going to mess with your, the head of your fly. I actually like to make this the head here a little bit bulkier. I appreciate a little added bulk on this thread, or on this fly. Again, if I was putting it in a shadow box, I probably wouldn't care less. This is a stainless steel dubbing brush, so I want to trim it off with wire cutters. And then, likewise, this guy on the bottom right here. Put it in. Okay. If you wanted to, totally up to you, you could put a little bit of a red throat in at this particular point in time. I actually think I'm going to do that because I happen to have a, a piece of red marabou hanging around my fly tying bench. I am trimming, I'm tying this off, not because I'm done with my thread. I will come back to this in a little bit. But because it's time to trim the fly. If you look at this, you have the beginnings of a fly, but we're far from done. So what I want to do is trim it evenly. Try to make it the same on both sides so it swims really well. Always like a bullet shaped head so it cuts through the wind very well. Okay, if you 
didn't use enough materials, you'll get a gap right in here, but I did. So I'm in good shape. Boy, this is kind of awkward here. Um, this is not the way I would normally hold this to trim, but I'm trying to teach, so I'm doing the best I can. Okay. I feel like a bit of a barber. Trimming a fly is a lot like um, working with spackle. you got to know when enough's enough. And as you can tell, I'm a little bit sparse on the belly here. Um, wish it would have come out a little cleaner, and I think that's because... I could have used a little bit more white in the dubbing brush, but I don't think it'll really affect how to catch fish. And this is one heck of a long and in long fly to tie. All right, I am going to remove this from the shank for just a minute, and I will try to put it in a position where you can see better. But this is how I would normally hold the fly to trim it. Okay, and I'm trying to keep it in the same position so that it's in, that it is in focus. Now, what you're going to get here is a tail that wiggles and breathes in the water. And this um, front section will be pretty stiff. And that is how a silver side swims in the water. Everything will collapse right in that hook shank. So the fish will be hooked on that with no problem. Sometimes if we clog that hook shank, we'll lose some very good fish on account of it, and we don't want that to happen. Okay. There we go. Looking pretty good. And that, folks, is the woven silver side. Now, all that remains is to put the head on the fly. And now you'll notice why it was okay with me that I, I have a little bit of a bigger head and I'm, I'm actually going to put even bigger head on this right now because I do have to attach some eyeballs to this guy and as I mentioned a minute ago I think I'll actually do something I hadn't planned on and I'll put a little bit of a red marable throat in so never cut marable always tear it and I don't want this to be very long Put it right over the back there, pull most of these fibers away, just enough to look like some blood spilling out into the water, still make those a little bit long. You can cut a couple of fibers, that's fine, just not the whole clump. Okay, you could do this with uh, EP fibers or high vis fibers if you wanted to. Just a little bit of red there. Again, for fishing purposes, that's fine. Let's see if I even like that. You know what? I'm not fond of it. I'm just going to leave it off. So we tried it. We didn't like it. Oh well. I could, if I wanted to, put a little bit into the dubbing brush to have red come out there, but. I really didn't want to go to that extreme. All right, so now I will whip finish for the last time on this fly. And the next thing I'm going to do is take some Aqua Seal and I'm going to coat the entire head in Aqua Seal. And then I'm going to put eyes on this guy. Use my bodkin to spread this stuff out. I, I have felt for the longest time that Aqua Seal has the best grip on these eyes, uh, better than Goop, and I wouldn't worry too much about it because as soon as this Aqua Seal dries and sets, I will then take the time to put epoxy over it, or at least Sally Hansen's hard as nails. Take off the eye here, lay it in place. Take off the eye here, lay it in place. One of the reasons I wasn't afraid to get rid of the red throat is I knew I had red eyes coming in the back. You can see the gap right in there. When you fill all that in with epoxy and put a thin coat on the outside of the eyes, likewise on the belly here, 
um, those eyes will be set in there permanently. Also adds a little bit of a jigging effect to the fly, which is always a good thing. So, the woven silver side. It's, uh, it's, it's quite a bit to tie, but it, you know what? It's a lot of fun and it produces. It catches a lot of fish. I, I began this video telling about how John Pecorum grabbed one out of my box and completely outfished me in Mauritius, which that's my water and it's not an easy thing to do with a fly rod and John spanked me on that day. And um, it's, a, it's a great fly. I like to carry it around. And this year I'm actually going to try to tie some in freshwater. I've caught some largemouth bass with similar flies. This year I'm going to try them for trout. All right. Have a great day. Enjoy and play with the woven silver sides. Any color combination that you want. Have a good day. Bye.